Uh, I'm Chris Harwood. I'm the vice. I'm the president of the New York chapter of SVU, the Czechoslovak Society of Arts and Sciences. And I'm very happy to welcome you to this program that we've had uh, in the planning stage for a long time, and are, are very happy that we can finally bring it to you. Uh, we know it's a topic that's of interest to a lot of our audience. Um, I would like to thank our uh, principal sponsor, the Bohemian Benevolent and Literary Association, which generously supports our work. Also, the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, who has awarded us grants that in particular have enabled us uh, to um, put our, our programming onto our YouTube channel. We'd also like to thank all of you who have donated individually or volunteered your time uh, to SVU New York. Uh, and at this point, I would just like to uh, turn the floor over to my colleague, uh, Viera Dvořák, uh, who will be introducing today's speaker. Thank you, Christoph, uh, and good to Sunday afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really my great, great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lida Kolb today. Uh, uh, Lida is a professor of linguistics and in department chair at East Carolina University in North Carolina. Uh, she teaches courses on English grammar, applied linguistics, sociolinguistics, but today she's here mainly because of her research interests. And these research interests span topics such as language and ethnic identity, heritage languages, language contact, attrition, language loss. She published extensively on all of these topics, including some articles in Czech in Naše Řeč. Um, and today she will tell us especially about her long-term endeavor called Texas Czech Legacy Project. Uh, this project aims to document uh, and study language and culture uh, of Moravians and Czechs who have been living in Texas for more than 150 years. And this project is actually based at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and she will also mention a link between New York City and uh, Texas Czech Legacy Project, which has a name and a face. It's name of Svatava Pirkova Jakobson, a wife of Roman Jakobson, who probably I don't need to introduce to many of you. And Svatova actually started her documenting efforts here in New York City and then continued in Texas. And Lida, in a way, like followed up on her work. She will tell us more about that. Um, now, before I give the floor to Lida, let me tell you a little personal anecdote about how we met, even though we have many shared interests. Um, it was not through any linguistic activity. It was actually uh, one day I went to accompany my 11 year old son to soccer. Uh, well, it was three years ago, so he was younger back then. And since we speak Czech together, I said something in Czech to him. And then a gentleman came to me and he said, oh, Mluvis Česky. And then we uh, started to talk and it turned out that he lived in Prague in 90s. And when he came back, he wanted to continue in his uh, Czech language studying. It was at the University of Arizona. And it was no one else than Lida who was doing her PhD there, uh, who actually taught these Czech language courses. And this gentleman is also in the audience today. So uh, when he when he found out that I'm Czech and I'm a linguist, he said, oh, you must know Lida. Uh, you must get to know her. And I'm very glad that we got introduced to each other because uh, I admire a lot of her work. It's, it's all very interesting. And I'm really happy that she can tell us more about it today and to all of you as well. Uh, just a disclaimer to make, this is a general talk, it's not a linguistic talk, so anybody like uh, can understand it, but if you are interested more in Lida's work, want to learn, like go sort of deeper into any of these topics, uh, feel free to read uh, some of her articles or even reach out to her directly. Um, and then there will be questions at the end of this talk. We want to give lots of space to them so you can put them in the chat or at the end of the talk, you can also raise her hand and uh, we'll like pick questions depending on how much, how much time we have, but definitely we will give space to discussion. So with that, let me uh, give it to Lida. Uh, thank you for this nice introduction and thank you all for spending part of your precious Sunday afternoon or evening with me. Um, everyone's life is a project. Uh, for this presentation, Texas Czech Legacy Project refers to both the sum of my work on historically Czech communities in Texas and the digital audio archive of Texas Czech speech we've been developing. Most of my research examines the culture, language, and identity in Czech Texas. 
My interest in Texas Czech was only deepened when I worked in the late 1990s with Svatova Pirkova Jakobsen's recordings in the Center for American History at the University of Texas at Austin. I found her bigger than life uh, personality and untold accomplishments fascinating and inspirational. And uh, since um, her folkloric work began at the, on the East Coast in the 1940s, New York City, I'd like to begin by saying a few words about her. Um, after that, I would like to uh, consider the question of what we lose when we lose a language, run around the world to get an idea of where Czechs are, and zoom in on Texas Czechs in four parts, building a new home in Texas, the making of a diasporic language, unbalanced bilingualism and shifting identities, and Texas Czech legacy project, whose main objective is to document this dying diasporic Czech. <laughs> Should I keep going? Yeah, keep going. I'm trying to figure <laughs> out. Please mute yourselves, everybody. Okay. <laughs> Except All right. Svatava Jakobsen's life and work story has fascinated me uh, or have fascinated me if, ever since I listened to the first recordings at UT Austin in 1997. I began to investigate locations for all the boxes that her former students stored for years. Uh, just to give you an idea, one of the students had them stacked up in her garage since Dr. Jacobson's death in 2000. Thanks to the leadership and volunteers at the Texas Czech Heritage and Cultural Center in LaGrange, Texas, we now have an additional location for the Jacobson collection, which with the hundreds of hours of recordings, 25 boxes of songbooks, photographs, manuscripts, field notes, personal letters, and more now, amounts to about 33 linear feet of material. Uh, Svatava and her husband, Roman Jakobsen, arrived in New York City in 1941. As a folklorist, she was fascinated by the life in Czeskach, the Czech quarter or Czech village on the upper side of Manhattan. In a letter to Maria Habrankova, a close friend and another linguist uh, in then Czechoslovakia, she writes, I have continued with my sociologic musical work here among our countrymen, thousands of whom live in the Czech water of New York and on the farms in its vicinity, have taught Czech at two universities to white and black Americans, Slavic people, American Czechs and other nationalities. And it makes me very happy to hear uh, them speak and read it. Sometimes I dream that, I, that I'm walking through a crowd of people speaking Czech. When, he'll, when will it become reality? I am working on two books, one about the state of the Czech folk song and music in immigration, and the other a monograph about an old woman original from Slovakia and various articles was working with. Um, between 1944 and 1945, Svatava Jakobsen expanded her fieldwork among ethnic Czechs and Slovaks in New York City through her musical survey in Nedelní New York Stylisty with a focus on the role of Czechoslovak song, uh, folk songs in the lives of ethnic Czechs and Slovaks in the US. She described it as the first attempt at a, and first step toward broader study of musical interests and desires of Czechs and Slovaks in America. In stages, it will bring questions regarding folk and authored songs, music that you will listen to on the radio, song books, compu composers, uh, theatrical performances, dances, orchestras, and other musical ensembles, children's songs, school songs, etc. Svatava Jakobsen was initially worried that it would not generate enough interest and faked the first response herself just to be sure but her weekly column turned out to be very popular. As part of this work, she began to organize Husky Pisnichkazu or meetings of, of songwriters and singers for the column's steady contributors who were willing to have their performances recorded and shared. The first meeting was held in April, 1945 in the New York City Sokol Hall and attended by Czechs and Slovaks living in New York City, New York State, Connecticut, 
Illinois, New Jersey, and Michigan. I am very excited by the first digitized reel of a documentary that Svatava Jakobsen envisioned and directed in 1982, featuring the life and folklore of Moravia, Texas. Even though we have yet to find the soundtrack for the film, the film quality is remarkable and the image is priceless. Uh, look, for example, here on that quilt. This quilt still exists. This is the picture on the very right. Is the picture that uh, my friend just sent me compared to what we have in the documentary. Uh, here, Thaddeus Polacek, a Czech educator, a, educator and librarian from Schlenberg and Brian Banicek, who serves as the honorary counsel for the Czech Republic in the state of Texas. And I worked on the Briscoe Center's, um, uh, worked with the Briscoe Center's archivists to get it done. And uh, as it usually goes, we continue to look for more enthusiasts and donors to restore all of the film. So that is my brief introduction to Svata Jakobsen, and I would be happy to um, share all that I know with anybody who is interested um, um, later. So how does local language documentation work contribute to our global understanding of the role of language in our lives and of language change itself? Um, there are about 6,500 spoken languages in the world today. About uh, 2,000 of those languages uh, have fewer than 1,000 speakers. What do we lose when we lose a language? Well, we lose culture-specific human knowledge that contributes to our collective wisdom. We lose a sense of the past, understanding of where we come from, understanding our ancestors' ways of thinking, speaking, and being. We diminish diversity of the humankind, which does not bode well for our species. Just to confirm that Czechs are everywhere, I wanted to include this slide. Um, here are some numbers uh, on, uh, on uh, the Czechs in the world today. And that's according to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic uh, from 2011 estimates. Um, the three major motivating factors for emigration from the Czech lands um, are usually described as religious, socioeconomic, and political. Uh, we know that poverty drove out many low wage workers and farmers from the Czech regions of Austria as early as the 1820s and late Austria Hungary. Later, it was called Austria Hungary in uh, between 1867 and 1918. And then smaller numbers from Czechoslovakia between 1918 and 1938. The largest waves date back to around 1890 to 1910. Before World War I, most emigrants headed for the United States, Lower Austria, especially Vienna, Germany, and Russia. Fewer moved to, for example, Romania, Serbia, and Bulgaria. The post uh, World War II, uh, no, the post World War I recession stimulated emigration to other European countries like France and Belgium, and to South America, especially Argentina, during the interwar period. Uh, intergenerational economic prospects, increased mobility, and community permeability accelerated the pace of assimilation in urban areas such as St. Louis, Chicago, and Vienna, but Czech descendants with some ability in Czech can still be found among elders in many historically Czech rural communities, including those in Bosnia, Herzegovina, Croatia, Romania, Russia, Serbia, Ukraine, Canada, and the United States. This is what I mean by historically Czech communities, those that were formed as a result of religious and chiefly socioeconomic emigration between the 1820s and late 1930s. Um, here we see a map, which is a wonderful map, but you probably won't see much uh, of the details on it. Um, I am very happy to send it to anyone again who is interested. It's one of the very few that we have that actually has tried to map all the locations into which uh, 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 Czechs, uh, Bohemians and Moravians from the Czech lands were, were um, living to. Uh, 
that is not to say that we don't find Czechs living in Australia, Paraguay, or South Africa, but only in some places from the mid to 19th century through the first decades of the 20th large and in rural areas typically insulated and therefore self-sufficient settlements were formed. In all, nearly 400,000 Bohemians and Moravians came to the United States between 1850 and 1950. The influx slowed after 1918 and was further curtailed by the Emergency Quota and National Origins Act of 1921 and 1924. While the post-World War I period rallied American Czechs in support of the New Republic and later of the occupied Czechoslovakia in 1938, the post-1945 period leading to the communist coup in 1948 severed the contact and chilled the interest, which effectively ended organized emigration and began a steady decline of the Czech community in the United States. In 1980, most Czech populated states included Illinois, Texas, and California. New York City was not far behind. Political emigrants after 1948 and 1968 added to the estimate of nearly half a million Czechs in America by 1989. And by the 2010 census, we know that at least a million, um, 1.7 million um, Amer uh, Americans claiming Czech or Czechoslovakian ancestry. Now on this map, there are also other states in which, Czechs, uh, in which Czechs or descendants of Czechs would live. Uh, Texas, um, I am going to talk about, but then also Oklahoma or Virginia. There would be other places, but the ones that are circled are the main states in, uh, in which, uh, to which they, um, or in which they settled. The 2010 census's American Community Survey uh, in, uh, from about 2011 informed this nice map showing Texas at the top with an estimate of 207,000 um, Czech Americans. And then you see California and uh, Illinois, Minnesota, Nebraska, and Wisconsin, which are between 90,000 and 125,000. A lot of numbers. Off to Texas. Uh, the district chain migration to Texas from the impoverished Moravian and Bohemian regions of Austria and then Austro-Hungary began in the 1850s, but the major emigration waves fall between the 1870s and 1920s. Uh, by district chain migration, um, I mean the large scale migration and a kind of chain reaction where a few people from a small village would start a settlement and many other families from that same location would follow. Um, first, Czechs began to settle in Texas in 1847. Most settlements were built within the Dallas, Houston, San Antonio Triangle. It is sort of a triangle. Uh, reaching south to the Corpus Christi area, many in the proximity to those already built by Germans. As for Czech speakers in Texas, the 2010 census records around 8,700 Czech speakers out of 136,000 persons of Czech or Czechoslovak descent, though we don't know how many of these are self-identified as for Czech speakers. That also means that we really don't know how many uh, Czech speakers from these who would be the descendants of people from these historically Czech communities there are. So even if I can look at the 2020 census and see that there are about 5,200 uh, people who speak uh, the language other than English at home among the Czechs, it could be just from the, from this, from the later um, emigrate kind of, um, um, you know, immigration to, to Texas. Uh, the settlers build their own churches schools, dance halls, and fraternal religious and theatrical organizations. Once um, I was told that if you have two checks, you need three organizations. They patronize their own businesses, stores, and pubs, and publish their own newspapers. Uh, among uh, about 30 Czech periodicals published in Texas before World War II, where Svoboda, Hospodář, and Nashinec, that was published from 1914 to 2018. And what you see here is the very last issue from May 
12, 2018. And on the right side is the publisher of this um, paper, Mr. Joe Rado from Granger, Texas. The term diaspora refers to Czech speaking locations outside of the present day territory of the Czech Republic, specifically the regions of Bohemia and Moravia. I mean the term as in Czech diaspora. Texas Czech is a critically endangered diasporic dialect of European Czech, a product of some 170 years of contact between Moravian Czech and English in Texas. The dialect has long ceased to be transmitted to next generations. Very few fluent speakers remained and its current use is limited to words and phrases reaffirming the belonging to the Texas Czech community. It is a blend of archaic Eastern Moravian and Silesian or Lachian dialects with traces of central as well as northeastern Bohemian and southwestern Bohemian dialects mixed with the school Czech and English spoken in Texas. Um, this map comes from the Institute of the Czech Corpus in, uh, in Prague. And basically by those numbers, you see the region. So where I try to draw the lines, that's the major areas from which um, um, Czechs were coming. Compared to other American Czech varieties, such as those in Minnesota, Nebraska, Kansas, or Wisconsin, Texas Czech is unique in that the dialect concentration in its baseline overwhelmingly originates in Eastern Moravia and Silesian dialects, um, uh, Eastern Moravian and Silesian dialects, as this map based on the study of tombstones in Texas cemeteries nicely demonstrates. And again, you see that there is a smattering of Bohemians as well. I just, I, I've been going to Texas for a very long time and only very recently I, I happened upon a person with a Bohemian accent, which was very exciting to me. So there are not that many, that many of them, but, but um, they, they are there too. Uh, now that we have the big picture view and some background on Czechs in Texas, let's define a few terms that will be important to the understanding of how a diasporic or contact language comes about. So language loss has been a pressing issue for both indigenous and minority languages. We know that. A diasporic language like Texas Czech typically results from language shift, which occurs over the course of three to four generations in language contact situations where a small, something happened now. Something happened to you as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some other, so we start, we see like a screen of a phone or we something. We see somebody's iPhone. Yeah. So you know what, let me share screen. Um, yeah. Should I exit and try again? Yeah, just start sharing again. I don't know if someone else started to share what happened, but that will be the best way to. So just click on share screen and click that presentation again. Okay. I should yeah. be back in then? Perfect, yeah, we are back. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, uh, so you've got the language shift um, which occurs over the course of three to four generations in language context situations where a smaller subordinate language like Czech gradually gives into the socioeconomic, political, and cultural pressures arising from the long lasting and intense contact with the dominant language like English. So gradual language loss, which best describes the type of um, language context situations we are discussing today, refers to the gradual shrinking of both the context in which the language is used, maybe just for greetings, weather talk, et cetera, and uh, language's structural properties over time. The process of language attrition in these language context situations is accelerated by incomplete acquisition, which means that children switch to the majority language uh, full time before they achieve full ability in their heritage language. And when we say that intergenerational language transmission is lacking, we mean that um, the home, school, and community link has weakened. And institutional support from the dominant society is lacking. Language aside, 
when looking at the language of individual speakers. Whereas loss better captures this process unit level. The strongest years of American Czech span from the 1890s to the 1930s. The same thing goes for um, Texas Czech. Language maintenance has been affected by the usual social factors such as location. So more open, more insular farming in this case, community relation here being tight. It's a self-sufficient social network. Only gradual acceptance of intermarriage, gradual reduction and abandonment of intergeneration, intergenerational language transmission. That's a big word that goes, that describes the transmission of language across generations. And that was after World War II. Religion here, especially the existence of Catholic private schools and the unity of the brethren Czech summer camps imported Czech priests for a period as well. And access to heritage language education, um, which was increasingly curtailed, starting with the Texas 1871 law that, uh, um, that meant only English uh, medium instruction in public schools was allowed. Um, like other minority languages, Texas Czech is marked by a shift toward the dominant language, very idiosyncratic grammar and very limited use. In the process of language shift, three major processes we may call deceleration, acceleration, and attrition in contact are at play. So I'm going to try to illustrate what these, what these are. So with the slowing down of change or the deceleration, Texas Czech has retained some archaic features uh, that you will not find in the dialects um, on the territory of the Czech Republic, or there would be probably just very few occurrences of, of such usage. So what the Texas Czech uh, retained is, for example, this archaic, it's called a pluralis respectivus, doesn't matter. It's just basically a respective plural to refer to family and other respected elders as in tatinek haidu or imiali farmu, where you see that you've got the singular for daddy, haida, and then you got the verb head in, uh, in plural. So the translation then is daddy haida had a farm. However, there is a disagreement in number between daddy haida and head. Um, then um, you have acceleration that on the other hand means that some tendencies that are already present in the source language, that is the Czech in the, on the territory of the Czech Republic, the living language, tend to spread faster and wider through the contact language system where standard Czech has very negligible influence. So one example from Texas Czech is the overuse of demonstratives like tentato, as demonstrative determiners. So here you have something like yataki odebiram ten hospodash. Um, if you speak Czech, you, you know that, that ten is not necessary, but it's it can be at least in part linked to the article, uh, the definite article before hospodash. So I also take the hospodash. Hospodash is one of those papers. Uh, that I mentioned published in Texas. In any case, so you would see that influence. And, uh, and uh, so uh, I guess corpus studies can show that there will be a higher frequency of, of, of such usage, and, but there, there would be an increasing frequency of such usage in Czech on the territory of the Czech Republic as well. It's just not as fast as in the language that kind of is not reined in by standard Czech. Um, Attrition in contact results in a re the reduced and reanalyzed version of the source language. So processes like blending in form, innovation, and restructuring are typically involved. So I won't be using like real terms, but it's something like a, what we could call a blending translation and meaning extension. So if you look at these words here that you see in the little table, I will read them to you. And I was wondering if you could put in the chat what you think that these words are, um, if you can guess them. So 
uh, you have Pichese, house or housing, drugstore, store, store, Hontovat, Braunove, Pinkove, Pikovat, Piksak, Tribovat. Now those last three are a little bit more challenging. So I'm going to give you like, if, I don't know, I can give you much, I guess, since we've had so many issues, but maybe 30 seconds. <laughs> you can try to guess some of these words. And Vera, would you help me? Um, yeah, I will go through them. So please, any of these words, if you have a guess what it could mean, just put it in the chat. And I will let Lida know. So, hantovat, love it. Někdo říká, someone is saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, color brown. That's mm -hmm. Somebody got peaches uh, as peaches. Oh, very good. It. Very good. Drugstore, yeah. To peak. So, somebody has pikovat as to peak. Somebody else, I think, said pick as pikovat, which people say pick pikovat. Or peak. Trybovat uh, skoušet. So to try. Oh, as in try. Mm -hmm. As in try, yeah. Housik domek, little house. To pick. Uh, but that's Kristoff. It's a spirit, trahat. To collect, to pick, yeah. To okay. choose, pick. House, doom, pick sack. Oh, somebody says. Uh, somebody who is like picking things. Kdo něco zbírá? The one picks up, so it would it's be a like good a guess. Yeah, picker. Somebody who who. That's a tough one. I got this one yesterday. Um, yeah, brownové, hnědé, brown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was pinkové. I don't think anybody said pinkové. What is pinkové? So yeah, rouge, pink. Okay, so I think okay. yeah. So here you have it. So you've got peaches and house or a small house drugstore or store uh, to hunt brown, pink to pick, to pick as in to pick cotton, especially. It's not like to, I don't know, to pick a nice dress or something, but it's really, you know, used in, in that context. Um, and then uh, a, that pick sack comes from something like a pick sack or a picking sack for, again, collecting cotton. And tribovat is is um, kind of more distant from what you would have in drivovat, but it definitely does still mean to drive. So this is the kind of you know innovative kind of blending that that they do, and you probably can tell that um, you know anybody who speaks Czech and English actually does that. Um, you know a lot of these oba about these endings on, on, on verbs, we do it all the time when we kind of, you know, incorporate um, words into, um, you know, in, in our bilingual repertoire. So, so it's, a, it's a very typical, it's a very typical trend. Uh, now the, it's also the one thing that Texas chicks are most, uh, most aware of, that this is what they do and that's why they do not speak proper Czech. Uh, let's uh, let's look at the other two examples. So you have, uh, I need to explain a little bit about this though, that languages are of different types. So English orders uh, words with very rigidly, whereas Czech word order is more flexible. In English, you have to say she went home, whereas in Czech you get by with went home because went already tells you it's a female and it's just one female. How close to uh, how close or how distant these languages are in their typology then makes a difference in what happens to the smaller language in a context situation. On this translation example, we see a copy of the English sentence structure filled with words in Czech. So you have Tetka Ujeli Jetska Topit, which is a, a, an exact translation of Auntie will make the kids to the kids drink it. The only thing is that you know you have this this these two words it and drink in different order, but that's it. It's a very unusual construction when you think about it. Also, so you know this is how basically Texas chicks would deal with it. Um, on this translate on this, um, so that's this one. And then finally, shifting and broadening of meanings shows in this example 
Moja sestra šla do České republiky, which should be letěla, which means flu. And uh, that has to do with basically uh, the fact that fly is somehow swallowed by a broader term go, and one goes regardless of the means of transportation from your own feet to airplanes, it doesn't matter. So broadening of these meanings that also uh, happens very often. So these are just some very, very few examples. Um, and so what are the few remaining contexts that encourage the use of Texas check if the occasion is right? Here are some examples of those, um, including greetings. Um, oh, wait, wait, this is not the one. I'm showing you a different slide. I'll talk about this slide, I'm sorry. So how do Texas checks uh, describe their, their speech? So they refer to these features that we just talked about that they can tell. About the sentence structure, I don't think that they would be able to comment on that, but especially the choice of words, they do. And so some of these uh, descriptions are, we, if you could read the, the, the English, I will read the check to you. Uh, then you have, is lying it up. To je jak ten Tex-Mex. Potrhane je, když tohle je z bucketa. Bucket, bucket is a bucket. Uh, my máme namyšlené slova v našem češtině, to už není čeština, moje děti tomu rozumí, ale už neumí. So uh, that's how they perceive it. And here are those contexts that I started talking about. So um, you would have greetings, something like Dobrý den, tož vítáme vás, pánem Bohem. On the right hand side, you have the translations of these expressions. Uh, then you would have an exchange like, jak se máš, how are you? Jak starý pes, how an old dog? Uh, jak práca ide, pomalý a furt? On je nejlepší, když spí. He is best behaved when he is asleep. Jejdanečky, those are, so that would be teasing. Jejdanečky, those are those emotional interjections, um, like wow, or no, or attention. And then when they discussing the weather, like um, we need rain. So those could be like the limited context in which you would uh, still hear some check. Predictably language has become one of the markers of Texas Czech ethnocultural identity. Um, Sidelined by ethnic festivals and karaoke tournaments and parades of costumes and floats and kolachi baking, food pivo and importantly, polka band performances and dances. Texas Czechs are, are skilled genealogists who excel at organizing, fundraising, and building memorials that celebrate and teach about the community's rich history. The Czech Heritage Society of Texas is, uh, according to the, it's a quote, dedicated to preservation of Texas Czech heritage. It was founded in 18, 1982 and has 15 local chapters. Uh, a few of these chapters uh, sporadically hold community language classes. During the legislated um, Czech Heritage Month each October, uh, Czech Heritage Society of Texas members visit K through 12 schools to showcase various aspects of the heritage that they and many of the children have in common. Here on the picture on the right, or in the picture on the right rather, um, is um, I'm, I'm talking to the children at a Catholic school in Hallettsville in Texas. And it's in the moment when I was asking them who would like to learn Czech if the school offered the language. And uh, it seemed like there was a lot of interest. Uh, similarly, the Czech Youth and Family Day held every June by the Texas Czech Heritage and Cultural Center uh, and uh, the Czech Heritage, Soci Czech Heritage Society features demonstrations, workshops, and Czech bingo, engaging the participants in Czech English wordplay. Uh, the TCHCC uh, in Lagrange, Texas, incorporated in 1997, is a product of one of the most successful fundraising events in the community's history. I encourage you to visit their pages to see what all they have to offer. Um, the historical village on the grounds of the, uh, of the center, uh, here you see the barn and a couple of houses, 
Some of them are turned into, into small museums um, also. So all of these are donated buildings that were moved to the grounds of the center. And uh, so that living, that, that kind of historical village is quite impressive. Um, since, it, since its inception, the center held, uh, has held the annual May celebrations and other events celebrating the community history and culture and hosted traditional craft presentations and workshops, adult community language classes and school um, tours. Here you see, we had an exhibit of Svatava Jakobsen's photographs. Um, that was one of her projects from the 1980s when she was uh, going around and taking uh, quite professional pictures of, uh, of the costumes. Um, both the Texas Czech Heritage Cultural Center's Náš Český život and Czech Heritage Society's Český hlas, those two newsletters uh, bear Czech titles but are published in English. Um, heritage events create spaces conducive to small talk exchanges, just like we've seen, and also um, they are conducive to the display of Czech in print on baseball caps, t-shirts, buttons, bumper stickers, and other merchandise. For that, I'd encourage you to visit West, especially West in Texas, um, best during the annual festival, West Fest, uh, which is usually in the late summer. The virtual life of Texas Czechs includes their active presence among the groups on Facebook, um, and also a year worth of Texas Czech um, show broadcast on the Czech American TV, featuring events and interviews showcasing museums and traditional folk arts. Texas Czech Heritage and Cultural Center keeps a strong presence on Twitter as well. That also teenagers get involved only demonstrates that Texas Czech culture's agility as it creates itself um, remaining authentic for those invested in it. For example, several Ennis high school students formed their Moravians uh, polka band in 2009. Uh, West has long been known for its high school uh, group, junior historians, um, Czech polka dancers performing traditional dances such as Beseda across Texas, and the Czech folk dancers of West perform at festivals across the state. And then the winner of the Czech Heritage Society's annual Miss Texas Czech Slovak Queen pageant becomes the face of the entire Czech enterprise for a year, as you see here in these pictures. One could say that the heritage language of uh, Texas Czechs rests in the background of their favorite pastime musical performances, starting with, if I can speak it, at least I can dance it, but often with the subtext I wish I could learn. This widely held affection for and pride in Texas Czech folk music and polka dancing could be exploited to help awaken a desire to learn um, the language to which many Texas Czechs remain attached. So through such outward, and that's what I mean by the term symbolic or emblematic expressions of identity, Texas Czechs continually reinvent the past and invent the present feeling their adaptable and dynamic ethnicity with what being a Texas Czech means to them. Uh, you might be asking, uh, how about uh, learning? Do they actually, is, are there any classes uh, that people could take? So yes, you could take community language classes occasionally. They are organized by uh, fraternal organization lodges, local chapters, as I mentioned before. And another type of a community language class was at first offered as a continuing education course at the Blinn Community College in Schulenburg, supported by a couple of Czech heritage organizations. And the course um, responded to the students' desire to better understand the dialects of their ancestors. So students would start with Texas Czech and then research expressions they know or they knew and then would overhear and they would kind of go in this contra contrastive fashion, you know, learning the, the terms in common Czech. Uh, stimulated by his students' interest, the Blinn College uh, librarian who teaches these classes then helped arrange a successful Czech cooking class and worked on lessons around various topics in Texas Czech history, since his students wanted it in Czech. 
and he also began offering these classes um, I, uh, or, uh, that I show on the second in the second picture here um, that um, are also offered online. So one can take them from elsewhere. Um, Czech in higher education largely falls on the Czech teaching at UT Austin, the heart of Czech Texas. The current Czech instructor has recently created um, openly licensed Czech textbook and curriculum. His name is um, Christian Hilchi. It's called Reality Czech and it's organized around the typical topics such as cuisine and drink, life in the city and so forth. And it's used in the first and second year Czech classes. They also teach classes in gastronomy of Central and Eastern Europe. That one is very popular. In addition, annually, the William Havinka Fellowship funded by the Czech Educational Foundation of Texas brings an advanced graduate student to Texas A&M University, specifically from a Moravian University, to study and teach community language classes and provide Czech English translation services to the community. Um, lastly, have you heard about Benji Smetana's opera, The Bartered Wife, performed by the students at university at the University of North Texas in Dallas? Um, so there was another one, and they also they also traveled with it. Um, so um, that's that's another university that gets involved. Uh, so finally, um, if you are still with me, I hope you are. Uh, on to the Texas Czech Legacy Project. So uh, during my fieldwork in Texas, uh, back in the late 1990s, I collected over 300 hours of speech data from interviews, as well as community events like picnics and polka dances and festivals and taroki and bingo evenings and weddings, um, all kinds of things. I was able to analyze just about 40 speakers for my dissertation. So in the next decade or so, I continued to visit Texas and collected yet more interviews. Uh, by 2012, I learned about the Texas Czech uh, dialect project that John Tomecek, then a master's student at UT Austin wanted to get started, modeled on then already successful Texas German dialect project uh, led by Dr. Hans Boas at UT. But John graduated and moved on while the idea stayed. By 2012, I have also I, I, I had also I also began to collaborate with um, Hans Boas, who listened to my plans and supported the TCLP beginnings with great enthusiasm. I also had support from the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Studies, uh, led by Mary Newberger, and help of two Czech lecturers in the department: first Veronika Takerova, then Mark Hopkins. I worked with the Liberal Arts Instructional Technology Center, which began a long-term collaboration with the programmer, Ryan Miller, who oversee, oversaw and still is helping me with the site development, including its searchable archive of recordings. So we have just transitioned to the latest version of Drupal on which the site, that's the platform we are using. So if you see any glitches, if you go to visit, then please let me know. As you can tell, um, given the amount of the material we have access to, this is a monumental undertaking. Thus far, our small team, and now it's actually just me, has built the infrastructure for a digital repository of audio recordings and begun uh, to fill, um, fill it with um, transcribed segments of speech collected from Texas Czech speakers spanning the 1970s through the 2000s. The principal databases include 350 hours of recordings by, by me. Um, then it's about 10 hours from uh, Dr. Karel Kuchera uh, from Charles University when he visited the States and hundreds of hours um, uh, by Svataba Pirkova Jakobsen between the 70s and 80s. Um, so if you go to the Texas Czech Legacy Project, then this is, uh, and you try to, um, access the archive, this is a login page that you will see. First time users must create a username and password to enter the archive, but it's a very simple process. And I monitor any requests for help, comments, suggestions, and so forth through the contacts on our page. Uh, when you enter the archive, you will be able to search for various facets like uh, collection type, location, gender, and by topic or word combination of words that you are interested in. 
so this shows you basically, you know, the, on the on the right here, you have a page with the recording. If we still can afford the time, then I would like to take you there and maybe just show you. We don't have to listen because we might probably have um, technical troubles again. So um, if I can just show you what it looks like. Um, so since I am already logged in, then I, you don't see the login page. Uh, you can view the other pages, but you do have to log in into the archive. Uh, you can learn about the project here. Um, then uh, the in the news, um, you know, we list what's going on. Um, so um, if here you have a very very comprehensive list of references from nonfiction books to research articles, various links to things that are of interest uh, in the American Czech world. Um, here we have who we are or who we were when we still were together. <laughs> and uh, here you have a contact page and then uh, giving to TCLP um, because uh, this is really um, taking a lot of it. It's it, it, it just a very, very time consuming and expensive enterprise. So, um, so the Dalek archive now. So when you get into the Dalek archive, you won't see the top here, view, edit, delete. That's not relevant. But uh, you can, on the bottom here, enter the Dalek archive. So you will go through the login page that I just showed you. And then you will see this page. And this is where you have these facets that you can kind of mark it, you know, what you want to see. Maybe you want to hear somebody, like it should be a male and it should be somebody from Granger. And, uh, you know, you can also uh, choose sort of a, you know, a year from a year of birth for the people that we already have in the archive. The, the recordings are in very short segments. They are in, you know, about two minutes at the most. For example, if I wanted to look at the Zabiechka at, um, at Pig Slaughter, right? Uh, a tradition. I don't know if you heard about the beef clubs in uh, rural Texas, where people would be kind of, kind of uh, taking turns at killing the the pig, and then they would be sharing the meat because they could not refrigerate the meat properly. So a gentleman was describing to me how this is done, and so you would go here, and then you would say, "Ah, oh, this is too difficult. I'm not going to do this." So you could you could you could just you know look at the you could. You look at check, you could look at, uh, let's see what I have here. Yeah. So I can just, you know, see this if I want to. I can show English, um, basically play with it. Here you have, this one is the feature that I most wanted to show you because it's the easiest to read. So um, when you, then the transcript that you saw would be appropriate for a linguist, maybe more than for anybody who is just generally interested in hearing some Texas Czech or maybe learning a little bit about the life. And so, um, uh, and so, uh, and so you could just maybe read the English part of it. And then at the same time, you could listen to the recording. The recordings you can also download if you wish to do that. So yeah, that's the archive. Um, now, uh, let's go back. Uh, so to conclude, I should say that fieldwork projects around the world continue and valuable databases remain in separate open and published collections. To illustrate the will and expertise we have available, an unofficial collection of recordings from the Czech communities in Siberia, Northern Caucasus, and uh, Romanian Banat and Poland, Ukraine, Texas, Nebraska, and uh, many produced by student field workers is being curated by Robert Dittman of Charles University who often mentors such projects. The state-of-the-art Czech National Corpus Institute in Prague has published large scale corpora of spoken and written Czech and the Czech Language Institute has produced the multi-volume Czech Language Atlas and that's also available online. The next steps are therefore not only about resourcefulness or expertise as evidenced by the research referenced here, but about cooperation, funding, work power, and time. Here are some references. And here is my thank you. 
And uh, if you could, if you'd like to contact me, here you have it, it, the information for that too. And then I wanted to just tell you that we have an event uh, on Saturday, February 18, February 18 uh, at 10 a.m. It will be another presentation and discussion in which uh, we'll, uh, I, I, I will speak, but we will have Robert Littman and we will also have Eva Eckert. Maybe some of you have read her um, tombstone on the prairie. So, um, so it's going to be more like a you know discussion of three people who have done a lot of work um, in this area. So, um, and the link uh, for that event is on the bottom. Thank you very much for listening to me for such a very very long time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lida. It was great. And thank you for everything you shared. It was a great overview. And I know that many of these topics would, would deserve a presentation of its own. So we can all like clap uh, symbolically or aloud. So right now, if anybody has questions, you can either post them in the meeting chat or you can just raise your hand and uh, you will get the floor and you can ask your question directly. So there is this little feature at the bottom. If you sort of hover your mouse over the bottom of your Zoom window, it says reactions. And in the reactions, you can click on the little smiley, which is there and you can raise hand. Um, and uh, since I, so I see some raised hands, but I will ask my first questions to take like my, uh, uh, take advantage of the fact that I'm moderating this. So my question for you, Lida, is, um, and maybe, yeah, you can stop sharing unless anybody wants to go back to anything. So in that case, maybe we can leave it there. It's up to you. I don't know if you are going to need it. Yeah, um, maybe maybe someone could I ask. I don't know. That. Yeah. So my question is, um, so what, what I find really interesting is that first for many decades, um, Moravian was, uh, or Czech was kept in Texas, even in like better shape than it was, or in more preserved state than it was in Moravia itself. But then suddenly, or suddenly, slowly, they started to lose it. Is it just gradual change? Or was there anything that changed between that first period when they were doing like living Moravian culture and speaking, and the period when the language really started to shift and uh, you know, get more and more like mixed with English? What was what were the, the big changes there that were behind this? Well, it's never just one thing that causes this to happen. Um, I mean, um, you can take a variety of factors. I mean, after World War II, a lot of people, a lot of uh, young men who um, you know would would maybe would have just stayed and farmed in these communities they would actually not come back and they would move to the cities, right? So, um, so that's, that's one of the things that, that contributed to it. Um, it's, uh, you know, um, the TV became available um, already in, uh, in uh, the night, you know, the 19th century, like I was saying, in, I think it was 1871, in public schools, could not teach Czech and children were punished for using Czech uh, in the classroom. Uh, and so then you had only, only the, you know, the Catholic schools and then that unity of brethren, the campsites in the summer, you know, where they would be, um, they, they would be teaching children Czech. Uh, so so uh, a lot of people basically, you know, grew up, uh, this would be the breaking point, you know, after World War II, because there were so many changes. Uh, so the, the communities were not like repopulated like they, you know, they would have been, um, they would not be in that, in that same condition that, that they were before the war. Um, and so, and so, uh, so yeah, more people leaving these communities, you know, so that breaks that insulation, then it kind of loosens the social networks, you know, uh, you kind of let that English in more and more by necessity. And so that's, you know, how you get that, um, how you get into the situation that you do, um, that it's not no longer attainable, you know, uh, to just use, use check. Um, Okay, so it's really from going very tight knit community to like more. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, if you compare it, I mean, you have these urban centers like Chicago or Vienna, um, 
uh, where, um, you know, there were huge numbers of checks, huge numbers of checks. But um, again, you know, it's, a, it's an urban space and there's an increased mobility, right? Um, you know, people change jobs, they move to different neighborhoods, you know, so, so uh, that did not, you know, there was the, in, in Texas, the, it's, it's amazing that it lasted as long as it did. You know, given a big because it uh, and it, it's in part due to the envir environment in which uh, they lived and farmed, you know, and kind of uh, that close knitness that they had. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like in that way, it's unique. Okay, I see Wells Brown. You can raise it. Uh, yes, I have two questions for you. Actually, uh, one is. Uh, Thank you for mentioning Svatova Pirkova Jakobson. I remember her from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I took her Czech language course before she moved to, to Texas. Um, wow. On mm -hmm. one of your first slides, you had a link to a biography of her. And I wish you would give us that link again uh, so I can see it, maybe put it in the chat. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I can. I... At the very beginning, it was, I remember. Um, but the second question was, um, is it true that the uh, Texas Czechs lived in the same places as the Texas Germans? And did yes. some of the Texas Czechs also speak German with the Germans? Um, well, I... Okay, you you. What was the second part? You were saying that Texas Czech would be speak. Texas Czechs would be speaking German to Germans. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, not really. Um, so the German Czech relationship, as as you know, is complicated, um, and it's it's kind of interesting that you know the two nationalities that that did not like each other on the European continent. Uh, would um, kind of flock towards each other and want to live near each other um, in the United States. And so, um, yeah, at first they they would not, uh, they would oppose the intermarriage, you know, between Czechs and Germans. Uh, they they just, you know, they, it on the one hand, the familiarity of, uh, of being surrounded by Germans, I guess was kind of, um, um, you know, comforting, but at the same time, uh, you know, they, it's, it's not that they liked each other that much. Those things have changed though, over time. And, uh, what I found was that if you had a couple where you would have a Czech and a German, say a, a Czech wife, German husband, it might have something to do with gender too, but Czech, Czech wife and a German husband, then the husband would call himself a born again Czech because he would be dragged to all kinds of Czech events and he would just like participate in the Czech society so much more than um, you know in the in the German circles. Um, I don't know. I don't have any evidence of, um, and I don't know honestly. I cannot answer the question if they would actually use German with Germans. Um, you know, they would not do it um, now because the descendants very unlikely. They, they, if they can scramble some check, then that, that will be it. But, um, but you know, the first generations, maybe when they came, because a lot of them knew German, it's quite possible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's interesting that the Czech culture, maybe because of being even more unique and specific, like absorb the German one rather than the other way around. In, in this context. Okay, next question comes from Alec and Theo Jean, but I think it's Vera. <laughs> oh, hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, now I, I'm really sorry. There were three kids in the picture all over. So um, I wanted to thank so much uh, for this presentation. Thank you, Lita, for all the research and all putting the, all these various info together. It's really eye-opening. Uh, I have a question for you. So we're in New York area and I'm really scrambling to find anyone to have my three kids that I've been really just torturing to 
speak Czech, learn Czech, write Czech from early on. I'm struggling to find parents who would be doing the same with their kids. I find a lot of people who are first generation Czechs who just don't have their kids continue with the language. I just don't know how to how to get the message across or if there's even a way to just in a vacuum bring the next generation so they can still keep up with the language. Well, I think that Vera would probably be better to answer this question because uh, she would be a really good point of contact. And I see a hand too, uh, Ms. Urbankova. Yes, hello. Hi, Magdalena here. Uh, I am not sure about specifically New York City, but uh, there used to be a group uh, in New Jersey and there is a, they have a web um, group on Facebook. Czech Parents New Jersey, so you may reach out there if you're willing to cross the river. <laughs> or um, I'm not sure this is if this is appropriate, but um, I used to be part of that group and then I uh, moved to New Zealand. And uh, I miss uh, uh, US very much. <laughs> so um, I am actually teaching um, American children of a Czech descent uh, online. Uh, so if you would like to reach out to me, we can discuss that more if you would like to. Um, yeah, mm. so there are people, and of course, there is the Bohemian Society in New York City that I'm sure they will be able to link you up with other parents. Yeah, mm. yeah, we're we're part of the school. I know we are in Bojag very well. We My kids are um, at the school and everything, but the New Jersey parent group, that would be really great if there's an illegal, um, it's just a Facebook group. Czech parents, New Jersey? Yeah, or? I'll send you a link. I mean, I was leading the group and I left, unfortunately. And I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, they are parents who would like to kind of um, revive it. So I can point you to the specific people and you can get it humming again. Uh, so I'll send a link. Give me a second. I'll post it into the chat. Mm. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much. And also to follow up, I sort of uh, share Vera's sentiment. So even though I'm myself like involved in the Czech school in Astoria and I teach there, uh, there is really, for example, nothing going on in, in New York City for little kids, for kids younger than six years. And there's nobody really like taking responsibility for this because it's a lot of work. And there is definitely nothing being done by the consulate or Czech center. So it's all up to volunteers. If there is somebody who does something, then yeah but there is nothing really organized going on. So in, in a way, I sort of understand that, that given how many parents, there are like hundreds of parents, uh, uh, especially bilingual families, where uh, there it would be great to have some support. And I personally, and it cannot be all done by one person. <laughs> it de definitely, uh, it needs needs some support. And I think one, one thing which Vera talks about, and that probably wasn't the case for Texas, is that it's more common to have bilingual families where like father, let's say, speaks English and mother speaks Czech. And very often, again and again, I hear about how even if, let's say, one of the parents, typically the mother wants to keep Czech, what happens that the father feels sort of ostracized and separate and is afraid that the child won't have proper English. And so it's not four generations, it's like one generation. Even one generation, you lose the language because there's no support. Very often it's because the parents don't agree because one of them does not want to support their Czech speaking partner. So that uh, that I think it was probably uh, something that did not happen in Texas and why they were able to keep it for so long. Uh, but back to the, uh, I see we have many more questions. So David uh, Korn, you're the next one. Hi, Dr. Kopp. It's great seeing uh, how much you've accomplished over the past 30 years. Um, I just have two quick questions. The first is, um, it kind of relates to Viera's question. Um, whenever I, I speak Czech with, uh, with uh, Czech friends, by far the hardest, the thing that I'll say is that every word has seven cases. And, and this is something as an American a native English speaker, I'm very self-conscious of. So what I'm curious about is that when Texas uh, Czech started to blend the language, would you say that the, the seven cases, in other words, the endings like Jena, Jenu, Jena, you know, were, were those some of the first components of the language to kind of dissipate? Or was it more, that, because you mentioned the vocabulary kind of 
Ang anglicizing a little bit, but did, but mm -hmm. did you know were the endings also something that were kind of uh, dropped or or do you know yes. what I mean? Yes, yes, they would, they would, and so what happens then is that the nominative, genitive, and accusative are still better preserved, and then the other cases kind of go. Um, Sometimes if they learned certain things as a, you know, they have it as a frozen expression, then, uh, then, then, you know, the, the other cases would be attached, but, but it's very typical, um, you know, that, the, you know, that's a kind of halted um, communication, you know, when you don't have a, when you, when you are not using the right cases, you know, that's, that's how it's perceived. So, for example, I was doing a, um, let me see if I have it here, if I can find it quickly. Uh, yeah, right, right here. Uh, and I can, you can, you know, if you're interested in this, I can send you the publication on this, but um, uh, that in intellectual moral or morphology is the least effective really in borrowing, right? And so, so it's not that bad. But uh, you know, it would be um, example like you have a tractor and it's in nominative, right? Or um, um, we had a little bit of our land, you know, so that again would be so. Oh, Lida, your connection is getting unstable, so be really typical. Yeah. And then, uh, but sometimes I was across. That's it. Yeah, right. I, I, I can, I can. <laughs> we can have a conversation about that. Okay, and then just one more follow-up question. I noticed on the link below, right after um, uh, on the website, it says Alan Lomax, and Alan Lomax, of course, was the folklorist. Who went to the Mississippi Delta and recorded blues music and, made, and went back to England and went on the radio. Mm -hmm. And this is why, you know, you probably all know that, like why Eric Clapton and, you know, Led Zeppelin, why they started to love the blues. It, this was largely because of Alan Lomax. So was there a connection? Yeah. What, yeah. what was the connection between the two? Yes, there was a connection. And if you, if you, like me to come back then I will tell you about <laughs> tell you all about it yes she was she was working with him actually quite closely but Dr. Koko took you I'm just years. trying to be very okay. brief because I, I've yeah. been <laughs> okay yeah I'm, I'm done yeah. I'm done no but yeah it is it is a very interesting connection yes all right Vera can so, we so, I just doc, so Dr. Yeah, Koko he, he, okay okay Good. So you know what, uh, David? Yeah, you can stay a bit longer. Just, after just, just email. Okay. 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 Uh, oh, email Lida, okay. and I want to because I also want okay. to get into Yindrich Toman is the next one who has a question, and then I will read a question. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Very good. Uh, I remember Svatava relatively well, and she the the Lomax connection I think is through the Smithsonian Institution, who she was doing a lot of recording for. Uh, for that institution as, as well. It, she was, how, unfortunately, she was a pure data collector. <laughs> she almost didn't publish anything <laughs> to, to that's, that's kind of a, that's a great pity because she was uh, a field worker and she did uh, uh, already from her Czechoslovak days before she was located in Brno and uh, was a folklorist uh, there. So um, that's wonderful that there are these uh, recordings and that, they, that you can do something with them. The other question, point is, I taught in Austin, Texas in the 90s. Well, I was a visiting professor there for a semester. I did not study academically this community, community there. And there was a lot of community activities uh, that I was, of course, invited to, and I was quite aware of. The language attrition was phenomenal. I don't actually remember meeting dozens and dozens of these, uh, uh, let's say, countrymen 
the language uh, attrition was phenomenal. And also the students that I taught at the University of Texas who had some Czech background, they were just American students. So it was very difficult actually to, um, to claim that this was some kind of, how should I say, Czech activity. And one thing that I observed is, was that I was not aware of before, of course, uh, that many of these um, Czechs were actually not claiming Czech heritage, but that they were very articulate in saying that they are Moravians. And I was in 1955, shortly yes. after the Republic split. Mm -hmm. And there were discussions, for instance, in their meetings uh, that the Czech Republic should split, uh, that Moravia should be uh, an independent country. They followed that, they supported that, and they thought they speak Moravian. Uh, that, uh, which, was, which, which they do in large part, yes. Yeah, uh, so, uh, you know, that's uh, whatever they speak, there is no Moravian. Because Moravia has several dialect zones. Yeah, so, I know, uh, I know, but, sense, but the, uh, it's, yeah. it was their projection, and that's fair enough. They were, you know, uh, aware of uh, these situations. So this uh, leads to the question of, you know, who is Czech and who is what, because uh, they sail uh, in our statistics, etc., under the label Czech, but that was not the kind of uh, uniform opinion. And that uh, holds uh, in, on another level for the, for the American Czechs of the older uh, immigration waves. I am here in Michigan. People came to me, said, we are Czechs. We have these letters from our grandparents. Could you read them for us? And they were Slovak and they were confusing uh, citizenship. They came, their, their, their ancestors came as Czechoslovak citizens, and from that, from Slovakia, and from that they concluded that they are Czechs. So there is a lot to discuss on that line historically. Today we live in a different world, and but um, the, uh, the, uh, a large part of what we kind of call checks, uh, it's an imprecision, I would say, because there is a great variety in the background of the individual subjects. And, and um, I say, I would say in, in, in America, the, the number 1.7 million <laughs> sounds absolutely fantastic. I would say that they that the number is really they are ethnically and by their origin historically I mean yeah that's what it means pedigrees, I think, I think mm -hmm. they they are Slovaks actually some so, of them might be yeah well yeah I mean and people when they were coming they you know oftentimes they just declared that they were Austrian you know when they for did, instance or they yeah. were, Right, yeah, it, it's it's um, really just relying on the statistics. It's very difficult, but I did write about this this specific question of of the perceptions, um, you know, of self identification mm -hmm. um, amongst the people in Texas, and uh, it's very very true that you know a lot of people would be saying uh, that they are Moravian. It things have changed over time because the, the boundaries, you know, geographical boundaries uh, were kind of redefined and uh, the, the borders opened again after 1989. Then, you know, they started traveling to the Czech Republic a lot and, and they basically began to associate themselves more with uh, the, that Czech self-identification, you know, even though, you know, they, you know, originally would be saying that they were Moravians. So, so, um, so yeah, I have I have met a lot of proud Moravians, very proud Moravians. 
Yeah, I just wonder if that could also be related to the fact that their ancestors did not, when they were living, there was nothing like Czech Republic or Czech exactly, Republic. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's very much Mary. different. Mm -hmm. So yes. even in the families, the, the Moravian identity was much more pronounced than after the establishment of the independent Czechoslovak Republic. Mm -hmm. so, so. It, was even, it was even more complicated. It was even huh. more complicated. Because their Moravian identity was in the majority, as I could observe, North Moravian and Silesian identity. So I mm, yeah. met a, a lady from Brno who was not really accepted by that community. Because, oh, really? Because she was from Brno, and that was this kind of German Jewish town somewhere. Go who knows where and they were uh, they had a very special projection of their own identity and that's interesting to to of course to mm -hmm. know yes to study. and uh, and uh, it's uh, it's a part of the of the whole mosaic of self representation and self understanding yeah and also just a little, I think it's a nice contrast, like this allowed more like this nationalistic approach to part of Moravia they were from. On the other hand, very often you can see how Czechs and Slovaks still did not separate in New York City or abroad. They still think of themselves as one community, unlike, oh. you know, Europe, mm -hmm. where it's very clear now it's two countries. It's very so, interesting. It's very interesting that Svatova Jakobsen was asked to teach Czechoslovakian. And oh. she was at Columbia University. I really don't know how she did it. I don't know, Christopher, if you have heard about that or how, how that. I just, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I was, I was looking at those old catalogs when I was there to uh, look at some records, and uh, that is very interesting. I mean, I guess she taught Czech, but they called the course Czechoslovakian. Yeah. Okay, I, I have. There, may I, or did you still? Sorry, I didn't want to cut you. So let's go to the next question because I know our time is sort of like running out. Um, and that's a sort of very, uh, I think, Elida, you will like this question. What are the long-term goals for, for the TCLP and what resources are needed to achieve them? And uh, also sort of to follow up, who could use the product of this? Like, who is this aimed at? Who is this, uh, who, how do you see like this being used in the future? <laughs> So I'll start with that last question. Uh, the, the project, uh, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to transcribe the recordings so that um, both community members and linguists, and I shouldn't say both, I mean, community, um, community members, linguists, historians, anybody who is just, just interesting, interested, interested in hearing these oral histories would be able to read them and understand, you know, the, the, the transcriptions. So they are not very, they are somewhat linguistic, but not very linguistic. So accessibility was very, very important to us. Uh, so dialectologists, historians, you know, linguists, and obviously community members themselves, um, you know, that's, that's the main audiences uh, for that project. Uh, I mean, in my dream world, um, they would be, using uh, the project also in language instruction in Texas, because um, um, the, uh, a lot of people have somewhere parked a lot of expressions in their brains, you know, that are, that are, um, you know, that they know that their mom, yeah, their dad, their, not mom, mom and, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's fifth, sixth generation, but that they were, that they overheard, they are not using anymore, <coughs> uh, but they are able to pull them out and, uh, and then, and then, you know, they, they can, they can uh, kind of um, compare them to the expressions that, that are, you know, that would be um, the, the correct ones in, in common Czech. So, so I, I, I'm kind of a proponent of that, that kind of con contrastive approach. And I think that just hearing the speech in the recordings, uh, you know, uh, brings it a little bit closer to them, especially like uh, when, when uh, Professor Taman was mentioning those heritage speakers, you know, who really don't know much of anything else, but maybe something like, they see ale o pizza, because but the, grand, the grandma was using it, you know, she was saying, are you behaving like a monkey? And so they want to know what that means. And that's about all that they know. <laughs> but um, 
but that uh, that uh, that kind of is i think important for them to understand um for them to understand where they came from that connection um now as far as the endeavor itself uh well i will retire at some point and so uh, it it needs to be left in a state that somebody else can take it over now if you can find out some find somebody who can take it over <laughs> that would be wonderful uh, that i could start working with them uh, but but seriously, it it the, the transcriptions themselves are the most time consuming component of everything, and so you know when I can, um, you know I can I have sometimes I have students from Charles who are completing um, this this Zabochet don't know how to translate that uh, for uh, as they are completing their studies and so. Uh, Dr. Dittman, you know, advertises and then, then they work with me, maybe transcribed, you know, five, six segments, uh, things like that. So that's how we're getting it done. Before then, I had a couple of grants, so I was able to also pay other uh, tran transcribers. But um, but yeah, it's just like I was saying, you know, it, it requires uh, time and um, work power and uh, finances uh, for us to continue with it. Mm. So, so maybe some PhD students coming from Prague or from Czech, absolutely, Czech and helping you with this, and then using it just like you did for your dissertation for their dissertations. Yeah. That yeah. I think would be ideal. Mm -hmm. um, and fieldwork is becoming, I would say, also more and more popular in in um, in linguistics in general. I will read one more question from the chat. In 1987, I spent some time at the University of Texas. We heard that Czech was taught at some high schools in 80s is that still true? it was it was yeah it was taught in platonia and guess who taught it <laughs> the person who taught it is the same person that's teaching these classes at Brent community college it's still that one kind of enthusiast who is uh, who is teaching he was a high school teacher first <clears throat> he also actually appears as a key figure in svatava jakobson's uh, documentary because he was her student and kind of a guide to the communities when she was traveling around. And uh, he lived in Moravia. So he's like in that documentary, he's telling the story of Moravia. And then, you know, they they basically show the various folklore related activities. Um, and so, and so yeah, so it's the same guy. They they taught it face to face, and now what he does is he's teaching he's teaching these classes online. They did manage to get um, uh, make these courses credit bearing for high school students. So that that is one big accomplishment. Um, yeah, somebody actually mentioned that in response in the chat as well. Yana mm -hmm. Yana Riley. Um, but no high schools currently, so only that that one college. Oh, Yana Riley, she was behind the Czech TV, Czech US TV series on Texas Czechs. Okay, that's that's great. And I see her father published us for a while in Czech. In, in, oh, in wow. Hmm? The one which was mentioned in the examples, right? Ten hospodáře. <laughs> Dead hospodáře. Yeah. Uh, so I see Don Orsak. That's a question. Hi, Don. Yes, hi, Lita. <laughs> um, I was curious, or this is sort of a comment about your um, point at the beginning about um, what do we lose when we lose a language? Um, I just only thought of this um, about a month ago. I was with um, a man who was about 80. I went to make sausage with their family for the project I'm working on. And uh, I was reminded that people, many people who grew up speaking Czech, uh, Texas Czechs who grew up speaking Czech have such a particular accent when they're speaking in English. And he was one of those people. And I know my friend Lori Niver is on the call too. And Lori would testify to this, that um, it's it's not just the loss of the language, but those people who grew up speaking Czech who are in their 70s, 80s, 90s now, um, we as Texas Czechs are going to eventually lose hearing their accent, which is very comforting, those people. Um, so even though I didn't grow up speaking Czech, those are like these uh, tr little treasures in the community, yeah. those people yes. who have that particular mm -hmm. accent and my grandchildren will, they'll never hear those people because mm -hmm. they'll be dead by then. Mm -hmm. So 
I don't know if the accent in English is something that you've ever addressed in the project or ever recorded native well, I, text, I, I, text I, I did, I did a, that um, sound. a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I did not really study much in the phonology, but but but, but I um, of of Texas Czech. But one thing that you definitely can can notice is um, is the articles. The articles are pronounced more like the, you know, the than the, so that interdental sound is not there. And that's that's I think that that's the main that's like the main thing that I that I would say. Some of them more like would have younger people would have trouble with just sound on the other hand from Czech. So they would, uh, you know, kind of analyze it into a J, right? Uh, trying to pronounce it. But um, also uh, aspiration is a little bit different. And maybe that's one thing that you are hearing. So, so like P, T, K is not very aspired. Um, you know, in the speech of of a very um, you know the people who actually grew up speaking Czech, uh, and also one thing, one one more thing is that Czechs like tend to still keep voicing assimilation and devoicing at the end, which in English you don't, you shouldn't have, but mm -hmm. many mm -hmm. keep mm -hmm. doing that, and I think even their kids do, the mm -hmm. basic kids, you know, and and. Mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. to, of course, I do it as like somebody who only learned English much later in their life, but that's that might be another thing. But I really like that you call those features comforting because I think many Czechs just don't want to sound like, don't want to speak Czechlish. Um, maybe that's a bit different from what like Texas Moravians had, uh, but I like that you, that you see it that way. I think that it has to do with them holding on to the idea of the language. You know, that's kind of like, you know, they don't know it, but it's just just that idea of that language that comes with the identity that they, you know, that they share with their ancestors. It's kind of really important to them. Am I correct, Don, you think? Yeah, it's just, it's so recognizable when you drive mm -hmm. through uh, mm -hmm. Hallettsville or Shiner or one of those towns, if you encounter somebody who grew up, who spoke Texas Czech as their first language, mm -hmm. you can instantly recognize them. Mm -hmm. And it's, mm -hmm. just, it's just wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, any other question? Maybe last question, if anybody has any. Uh, also, Yana, she shared a comment, which I might read. I think the mentality of my grandmother, grandfather is Czech, but they do not identify as Texas Czech Moravian is what hinders the language in Texas. So it's now like from just, yeah, it's my grandparents, but not me anymore. I understand that correctly. And so maybe I'll have since nobody else. So, so my last question, I really like how you sort of summarize those areas where the language um, is being kept, which is usually sayings, greetings, expressions. I think that's something which we still see even for like Czech families here or bilingual families. If they're, they're these areas where it's really kept forever, especially like, you know, these, that's what the kids, if they don't learn anything else, they didn't learn how to scold, how they are often. And I think it's a bit unfortunate that they are being scolded in Czech and they understand that. Not so much praised because as you know, we Czechs have issues with, with praising. Uh, so I think that's, it's also interesting how many of these things still get repeated these days. And you can see- It's just a very typical way of code switching in bilingual yeah. families. I mean, this is one of the features that, you know, and it's it, it doesn't matter which language it is. You know, yeah. if they don't hear in this language, I'm going to try the other language, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so with that, uh, thank you, Lida, for all your insights that you gave us today for, for the great presentation. Thank you, everybody, for attending, for, for contributing to discussion at... Uh, we will also let you know through our Facebook channel or through email when this uh, talk will be available on our SVU. YouTube channel. Um, Susanna or Chris, do you have anything to add? Can... Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Lida, and thank you, Vera, for, for managing the, the conversation. Um, I just wanted to uh, flash um, uh, the slide for our next event of February. Uh, so please check us out on, on Facebook and, and uh, be looking forward to that. And uh, thanks so much to, to all of you for coming and listening today.